Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We'd like to welcome you all here on the ninth Sunday of Pentecost. My name is Reverend Aaron Boffman, and I'm the pastor here at Holy Trinity. A special welcome to any guests that might be joining us, or all of you that are joining us on Zoom this morning as well. I also just wanted to let folks on Zoom know that there is a copy of the message that is now uploaded right next to the bulletin. So if you want to download that, you're welcome to do that so you can follow along. Let's go ahead and take a moment to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. If you please stand for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned, we have hurt our community, we have squandered your blessings, we have hoarded your bounty. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned, we have failed to be honest, we have lacked the courage to speak, we have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. God is a cup of cold water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are freed and forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll continue. In the Bible, breath, wind, and spirit are the same word. Close your eyes, focus on your breathing, and as you breathe, choose one of the following prayers to help you focus on your breath. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the only Sovereign who dwells in light, Jesus Christ, who offers kindness toward our faults and failures, and the Holy Spirit, who lives within us. You may be seated. Let us pray. Beloved and Sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your Son, you bring us into your kingdom of justice and mercy. By your spirit, give us your wisdom that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from 1 Kings chapter 3. Because Solomon did not ask for long life, riches, or the defeat of his enemies, God gave him what he asked for, wisdom to govern the people well. Now the reading. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your, able, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil who can f govern this, your great people. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, said to him 
Because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. Word of God, word of life. The psalm is 119. Your decrees are wonderful, therefore I obey them with all my heart. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Order my footsteps in your word. Let no iniquity have dominion over me. Let your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. So at this point, I'd like to invite all those young at heart to come forward. And I might need some support, so anybody else want to come up, it would be great. Thank you. Good, I got two. Anyone else? If you come up, you get a gift today. Okay, I got one more. Good. Okay, perfect. I should have enough gifts for all of you. Perfect. All right. Merry Christmas, everybody. Did you know it's almost, well, it's Christmas in July. Last part of Christmas in July. Did you know that some people celebrate Christmas right now? Well, kind of. They celebrate Christmas in July. We always did it at camp when I was a kid. So I brought some Christmas presents for you guys today. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. All wrapped with recycled Thank wrapping you. paper. Merry Christmas. Thank you. From Christmas's past. Merry Christmas. All right, so you guys can take a seat wherever you'd like. Yeah. And I have a question for you all. What do you all want for Christmas this year? We got peace. Oh, that's a good one. Good health. <laughs> good health. You don't know yet? Some cool toys, maybe? Maybe some dolls or some cars to play with? What was yours? No guns. No guns. That's a good one, too. Yes. Well, in today's message, Solomon, who was only a teenager when he became king, he could ask God for anything, kind of like how we can ask Santa for anything. And he could have asked for money, he could have asked for toys, he could have asked for prosperity. But you know what he asks for? He asks for wisdom to be a good leader. He said, give your servant therefore an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. And God replied to him, because you have asked this, and not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do accordingly to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. So God was very pleased with Solomon when he asked for wisdom over anything else. So this year, when you think about what you want for Christmas, some of you already gave some really good things to ask for. <laughs> but think about what it might be like to ask for something like wisdom over anything else. Let us pray. You got one hand, you got two hands, you got prayer hands. Gracious God, we give thanks for the gift of being able to ask you 
for anything. And we know that it's one of the things that you long to hear from us is for us to ask for wisdom. Wisdom to be a leader. Wisdom to be one of your disciples. Wisdom to know good from evil. We ask that, we pray for the whole world that people might ask for such things and that you continue to bless us with the gifts that we do receive. And we give thanks for those too, whether they're now or at Christmas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for coming up. I hope you enjoy your Christmas gifts for Christmas in July. They're all edible, so... The second reading is from Romans chapter 8. These words celebrate the depth of God's actions for us. Through Christ's death for us and the activity of the Spirit praying for us, we are fused to God's love poured out in Jesus Christ. Nothing, not even death itself, is able to separate us from such incredible divine love. Now the reading. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And the Lord, who searches, searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that in all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was risen, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Word of God, word of life. There is good news for us today, and it comes from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Glory Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds but when it has grown, it is in the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. 
The kingdom of heaven is also like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he has and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and threw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all of this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord, I believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You all may be seated. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So I wanted to start off today with a question for all of you. How many parables are there in the 13th chapter of Matthew? Any guesses? 13, that's a good guess. A little less than that. Any other guesses out there? Well, this, seven? Okay, that's a very good guess. So this week, we are going to be covering six parables. And last week and the week before, we covered two more parables from Matthew 13. So how many parables is that? Eight. So there's eight parables in chapter 13 of Matthew. Now that's a lot of parables to keep straight. And I'm a visual learner, so I went ahead and I created a little guide, a little bookmark for you guys that you can follow along with a picture for each of the parables. So I'm going to come down and pass these out to all of you now so you can follow along. You want to take one side? Sure. Okay. And they're different colors, so you can choose your favorite color if you want. I should have made them Christmas colors. I wore my Christmas stole today, since it's Christmas in July. I thought about wearing the Santa hat the whole time too, but then I thought no one would pay attention to me, so. Thank you. Yep. So hopefully these will help keeping straight all these parables as we go through them today. And if you'd like to, I'll also let you know what verse each of the parables start in. So if you wanted to look at the gospel in your bulletin, you can also follow along that way as well. Now, we're not going to cover in detail the two parables that are at the bottom of your bookmark, because those are the ones that we've covered in the past two weeks. But just a quick refresher on how these relate to what's being talked about today. And all of these parables relate to the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. So these first two, the first one is the parable of the sower. 
And if you might remember back to that Sunday, it was about a sower who carelessly tosses the seeds of the good news of the kingdom of God everywhere, unconcerned about how or where the message might land. The second one was the message of the wheat and the flowers. This parable is about how we might, what we might see as weeds among God's news that we've planted might actually be a beautiful understanding of the kingdom of God. And it's up to us, it's not up to us, I should say, to decide what is a weed and what is wheat. Rather, the angels will do that at the end of the age. So that's not something that we have to be concerned about. Okay, so now let's focus on the other six parables in the Gospel of Matthew 13. If you look through, you can follow along with the little pictures. And when you get bingo, yell out, okay? No, I'm just kidding. The parable of the mustard seed that grows into a tree is one of them. The story of yeast that is hidden in flour and leavens bread. The parable of the treasure hidden in a field. The parable of the merchant looking for a pearl. A net being thrown into the sea. And lastly, the master of a household who brings out old and new treasure. Whew, it's a lot of parables. So now you can see why I gave you a visual, so we can try to keep, keep track of all of them. So let's start by unpacking the last one, and that starts at verse 52. It's the parable of the old and the new, which you can see is kind of the first picture up here. Now, many scholars believe that this parable is actually a self-portrait of the author of the Gospel of Matthew. Might be kind of surprising. And you may or may not know this, but most scholars believe that the Gospels were not actually written by the apostles, but rather they were written by scribes who later took on the names of the apostles. Today, we would clearly call this plagiarism, right? But in 85 CE, this was a very common practice to take on a person's, like a well-known person's name and write as if you were actually that person. So the author of Matthew, who was not Matthew, but rather a scribe, placed this parable at the end of the chapter to show how he or she came to write the other parables. Now, it talks about a master of a household who brings out treasures from their storehouse that are new and old, meaning that these parables have been written with insight from the Jewish past of this author, as well as insight from older Christian traditions, such as the Gospel of Matthew. But the author also introduces new understandings of Jesus and the coming kingdom, presenting old in a new light. So the author is telling us a parable about themselves, which I think is really cool, because what the author is doing is being Christ-like in their writing. They're presenting us with a parable about how they did their research to write this chapter of Matthew. So again, just like the master of a household who brings out new and old from their storehouse, so has the author brought out wisdom from what is new and what is old in recording these parables about the kingdom of God. Okay, so that really leaves us with not eight parables from Jesus, but actually seven parables. And that makes a lot more sense because seven is a very holy number. So it would make sense that there are seven parables recorded in this chapter. So working backwards, the next parable starts at verse 47. And it's about a net being thrown into the sea. And when it's pulled up, it has fish of every kind. Then the fishermen sit down and they sort out the fish. They put the good into a basket and they throw all the rest out. Does this parable sound a little familiar to another one we just heard? Maybe the parable that we heard last week? Its interpretation is identical to the wheat and the weeds, or the flowers. And so the point of this parable, again, 
is the importance of just how, like the weeds and the wheat, it clearly says that we are not the ones doing the separating. If you look down at the explanation from Jesus, it says, rather the angels will come at the end of the age to separate the evil from the righteousness. So the important message here is that we are not the ones sorting out who is the good fish and who is the bad fish. That will be left up to the angels and to God. This is also made clear in this parable with how it says that the fishermen sat down to sort out the fish. This imagery was meant to have the reader think about Jesus because Jesus is where Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father to judge the living and the dead. So that's the little connection there. Okay, on to the next parable. So we're going to continue to work backwards. This parable starts at verse 45. The parable of the merchant and the, and the pearl, which you can find there on your bookmark. Does anybody have bingo yet? Anyone? Okay. Here, Jesus explains that the merchant sells everything he owns for a fine pearl that he has been searching for. And a piece of context here that is often missed is that in the first century Mediterranean world, a pearl symbolized the highest good. So the original reader would have, when they heard this parable and heard about a merchant searching for, the, searching for a pearl, they would have heard it as a merchant searching for the highest good. And it says that he has found it. So he sells everything to obtain this new higher good. This parable explains that living into the kingdom of God is the highest good. It is a pearl of great value, a lifestyle so valuable that one would give up everything for it. So for this to make sense, we need to take a moment and ask the question, is Jesus asking, or is Jesus saying that we can find the kingdom of heaven now? And does that make sense? Because in the previous parable, it says that the fishermen sit down and sort out the fish at the end times. So doesn't that mean that heaven is something that we look forward to in the future? So how does it make sense that we could also be in heaven or the kingdom of God now? So to better understand this, we need to take a quick moment, and I know you guys didn't know you were going to seminary today, but we're going to just take a quick moment to do a little bit of systematic theology. And we, so what systematic theology is, is to create a theology that is orderly, rational, and coherent to better understand. So from the previous parable, as I said, the net and the fish, the kingdom of God is something explained that the angels will sort the good into at the end times. And that makes sense, right? When you think about heaven, it's something at the end times, right? Something we look forward to. Jesus comes back and we end up in heaven, right? That makes sense? Do I see any head shaking out there? Yeah. Okay. That is fairly normal theological understanding. But the merchant in the pearl, he sells everything he owns to have the highest good now. He's not waiting to purchase this pearl until the end times. He, say, he buys it now and is able to have the pearl now. So here's where you need to be willing to think outside the box for a minute because if you remember from the other week, you cannot put God into a box. So if that is a the case, then as many Lutheran theologians like Ted Peters would suggest, God is outside the construct of time, which means God's kingdom, which is in the future, is outside the construct of time. So that means that through Jesus Christ, we can live into the kingdom of heaven here and now, even though it's an event in the future. Okay, just take a moment to think about that, because that's a really big concept to wrap your head around. So let me explain it one more time. God is outside of time because time is something that we created. 
which means God's kingdom is also outside of time, which means we can live in God's future now. I know, mind blown, right? That's like a really big concept to think about. And Jesus confirms this many times throughout Scripture when describing how the kingdom of heaven is both here and now, and also something that we're coming near to, and also something in the future. When they named Holy Trinity the Church of Tomorrow, I think they might have been on to something. Because yes, it is possible to live in God's future now. Because it's outside of our construct of time. So that means that we, as a church, what we seek to do is literally create heaven on earth. And that's true with church throughout the ages. That's something they sought to do. In fact, a little side note, that's why they always put stained glass windows in churches. is because they wanted to block out all of the chaos of the world and create heaven when we are seated together in worship. Interesting little fact. So I know that's a lot of theology, but I'm going to leave it there so that we can move on to the other parables. And maybe another day we'll go back. So the next parable is the treasure hidden in a field. And this one starts at verse 44. This one was most likely controversial because it's about a plowman or woman who is plowing a field that they do not own. And when they find a treasure buried in it, what do they do? Do they go and tell the authorities, hey, look, I found some treasure in this field that I don't own. Do they go and tell the owner of the field? No. And said they hide it, they go and they sell everything and they buy the field so that they can have the treasure. And the point here was probably less on the unethical action of the plower and more on the urgency in their action. They find this hidden treasure and they joyfully sell everything they own so that they can have it now. So similarly to the previous one, about someone who finds a pearl that they have now. This parable is about how when you find out the hidden knowledge that God's kingdom is obtainable now, you might just sell everything you own and enjoy to have this treasure. Okay, so we got two more parables to go, so stick with me. The parable of the woman in the yeast and the parable of the mustard seed. So let's start with the parable of the woman in the yeast, which starts at verse 33. To better understand this parable, we first have to understand how yeast was viewed in Jewish tradition. Yeast was seen as something that corrupted wheat when it made bread. So in Jewish tradition, when you used yeast in a parable or in a story, it was used to symbolize corruption. So in this parable, What is seen as corruption will be taken and turned into something new. Jesus will take, for example, an unjust economy and turn it into a banquet for all. Jesus is taking corruption and turning it into something that will feed all of us. And the reason that I say this, that this bread can feed all of us, is because the woman who's making this bread... She is not making one loaf of bread. She's actually making enough bread for about 100 to 150 people. And I say this because if you look in the text, it says that she uses three measures of flour. And three measures of flour is the equivalent of 10 gallons of flour. It's a lot of flour. And that would feed about 100 to 150 people. So if you think about it, this one woman is doing something miraculous. On her own, she is making a banquet of bread. So I think the other hidden parable that's here is the miraculous power of women. How it just takes one woman to stand up to corruption and turn it into a feast. I mean, who cooks bread for 150 people, right? That's a lot of bread. So perhaps the point Jesus is making with this parable is that it's women who will uproot the current unjust economic system, and they will bake an extravagant banquet out of it, one fit for the kingdom of heaven. 
And for Jesus to say that a woman is the one who will bring about change, especially in the ancient Mediterranean world, that in itself was extremely radical. Okay, on to the last parable, one that I'm sure many of you have heard before, the famous mustard seed that turns into a tree. Bingo. Bingo. Got it? Anyone else bingo? Now, just like the previous parable, it's very under, uh, important to understand the details of the elements used. So, mustard is an annual herb, and it grows about two feet to six feet tall. Has anyone ever seen a mustard field before? Okay. It's a beautiful field with tiny little yellow flowers in it. Very beautiful. But what you would not see in that field is a tree. There's not going to be any trees out there. Mustard plants do not turn into trees. All right? So in a way, this parable is similar to the last. Because it would be very radical to say that a tiny herb will turn into a tree. Especially an herb that, as Jesus says, comes from the smallest of seeds. So again, don't get confused here. There is no way that a bird would be able to make their nest in a mustard herb. This parable is a miraculous transformation story. It is sharing with us how the kingdom of heaven is, starts at a small herb and can grow into a tree. And there's a lot of meaning behind this. Because trees were used as a symbol of imperial power and they represented empires. Hence the tree in Revelation, the tree that grows on either side of the river of life, it's a symbol of the power of God's kingdom. And so here, saying a lowly mustard plant turns into a tree is this awesome parable that's really about Jesus himself. How God's kingdom grows from the lowest parts of society and is so powerful that it miraculously becomes a symbol of power, but one that is not of this world. Okay, so I know that was a lot, and I hope some of you did get bingo out there, but I found it's important to unpack each of these parables so that we can better understand what the scribe of Matthew was trying to convey about Jesus' teachings on the kingdom of God. So to summarize, first, the kingdom of God is something that we search for, like a merchant searching for a pearl. It is also something that we just stumble upon, like a plower who's out doing their normal task day to day, and they find a treasure in a field, a field that's not even theirs. And when we find the kingdom of heaven, and when we find that it is possible here and now, we might just sell everything we own to experience this treasure, this higher good. And the best people to bring about God's kingdom into reality are the most unlikely people. A kingdom that comes from the smallest seeds, then grows into an herb, then miraculously into a tree. A tree that is a symbol of power and strength. And yes, Jesus wants to be clear that it will be women who lead us in creating a world that is more just, more peaceful, more heaven-like. Because we don't have to wait until the end times to live in the kingdom that Jesus spoke of. God's time is not our own, so we can live in God's future here and now. So what are we going to do with this good news? Are we going to hide this information under a bush? No. We are going to let this good news, the good news that God's future is now, we are going to let this good news shine. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.